Hello, grade 11s. Today, we will look at Faraday's law of induction. This law is one of the most important concepts of electricity. The generators that we use to make electricity and transformers that we use to distribute electricity work on this principle. Faraday's law looks at the way in which changing magnetic fields can cause current in wires. As the magnet moves into the solenoid, a potential difference is measured on the voltmeter. When the magnet is pulled out again, a potential difference is measured in the opposite direction. Faraday's law describes how potential difference, or EMF, is created and how much is created. It's a huge concept to understand. A changing magnetic field can induce EMF and a current. Michael Faraday was an English physicist working in the early 1800s. Faraday's big discovery happened in 1831. He discovered that a change in magnetic field creates an electric current. Faraday's experiment started with magnetic fields that did not change. This was the setup that he used. The setup did not induce current. It was only when he changed the magnetic fields that the current and voltage were induced. He discovered that the changes in the magnetic fields and the size of the field were related to the amount of current created. We already know that scientists use the term magnetic flux to describe the magnetic field through an area. Magnetic flux phi is the strength of the magnetic field B multiplied by the perpendicular surface area of the device. If the magnetic field is not perpendicular to the surface, the magnetic flux phi is equal to the product of the magnetic field B and the area A cos theta, where theta is the angle between B and the normal of the surface. The magnitude of the induced current is dependent on three factors. They are the speed with which the magnet field changes relative to the conducting wire, the strength of the magnet, and the number of windings on the solenoid. We can prove this with a few simulation programs. In this demonstration, the brightness of the light bulb is an indication of the strength of the induced current. We start by moving the magnet slowly in and out of the solenoid. The bulb glows, but not very brightly. Now we will use the same magnet, but move it very fast. The light bulb burns brightly. The light bulb shines brightly when the speed of the motion is fast. We can conclude that the greater the speed with which the magnet is moved, the bigger the induced current or EMF. We can also use this simulation to see the effect of the number of coils on the induced EMF. A second coil with fewer turns on it appears. When we move the magnet through this coil, we see that there is not a lot of current induced since the bulb is not glowing very brightly. When we move the same magnet through the bottom coil at the same speed, you see that the light bulb glows much brighter. So, the bulbs glow the brightest when there are many windings on the solenoid. The conclusion is that the greater the number of coils on the solenoid, the greater the induced current. The last factor that affects the size of the induced EMF is the strength of the magnet. Here, we set up the demonstration so that the magnet has a strength of 50%. We now move the magnet in and out of the coil. Look at the brightness of the light bulb. Let's change the strength of the magnet to 100%. We move the magnet at the same speed as before and the solenoid still has two turnings on it. The light definitely shines brighter than before. This proves that a stronger magnet will induce a greater current when the speed of the motion and the number of turns on the solenoid stays the same. Keke will now show us how Faraday placed all of these factors into a law. She will also show us how Faraday derived an equation to calculate the magnitude of the induced EMF. From his experiments, Faraday developed a theory to explain why an EMF is induced in a coil when there is relative motion between a coil and a magnet. His explanation has become known as Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. 
have a careful look at this statement of his law. The magnitude of the induced EMF in a conductor is directly proportional to the rate of change of magnetic flux through the conductor. For a given coil, we can write a mathematical expression for Faraday's law as follows. E is directly proportional to delta phi divided by delta T. Let's look at what all these letters and symbols stand for. E stands for the magnitude or size of the induced EMF and delta phi over delta T is the rate of change in magnetic flux. Remember that the magnetic flux phi is equal to the product of the magnetic field B and the cross-sectional area A through which the field passes. So why did Faraday link the size of the induced EMF to the rate of change of magnetic flux? To understand this, let's think back to Faraday's original experiment when he placed a stationary magnet inside a coil. The magnetic field lines from the bar magnet cut across the area of the coil. So there is a magnetic flux cutting through the coil. But notice that there is no induced EMF in the coil. There is no reading on the galvanometer. Watch what happens when a magnet moves relative to the coil. When the magnet enters the coil, the field lines only cut through a small area of the coil, meaning that there is a small magnetic flux cutting through the coil. But as the magnet moves further into the coil, the area increases, which means that the magnetic flux has increased. So there has been a change in magnetic flux. This change in magnetic flux occurred during a certain time interval while the magnet moved. A change in magnetic flux per unit time is called the rate of change of magnetic flux. If we move the same magnet faster in the coil, the change in magnetic flux will be the same as when the magnet moves slowly, but the time taken for this change will be less, and so the rate of change will be greater. Kekka confirmed that the speed at which the magnet moves affects the induced EMF. Therefore, the induced EMF is inversely proportional to the time in which the magnet moves. The second factor that affects the induced EMF is the strength of the magnet. Can you see that the magnetic flux is dependent on the strength of the magnetic field B? If we make the magnet stronger, we will increase the magnetic field. Because a stronger magnet will have more field lines, it will cut through a larger area on the conductor than a weak magnet. The result of using a stronger magnet with more field lines is a greater change in magnetic flux when it moves relative to the coil. Also, a greater EMF should be induced in the coil than when a weaker magnet moves. The last factor that influences the magnitude of the induced EMF, according to Faraday, is the number of coils on the solenoid. Remember the simulation of the experiment we did earlier? Keke will show us how the number of coils fits into the equation. The number of turns in a coil is related to the size of the EMF induced in the coil. In this experiment, we have moved the same magnet through the two different coils in the same amount of time. So the rate of change of magnetic flux passing through each coil is the same in both coils. In this experiment, the rate of change of magnetic flux is a constant. We can therefore state that the size of the induced EMF is directly proportional to the number of turns n. These experiments have confirmed different types of relationships for induced EMF in a coil. Now we can combine the two relationships we have found and write an equation for Faraday's law as follows. E 
is equal to n times delta phi divided by delta t. E stands for the magnitude of the induced EMF, n the number of turns in the coil, and delta phi over delta t is the rate of the change in magnetic flux. Remember that the magnetic flux phi is equal to the product of the magnetic field B and the cross-sectional area A through which the field passes. To explain the direction of the induced EMF, we have to take Lenz's law into consideration again. According to this law, the direction of the current opposes the change in magnetic flux by creating its own magnetic field. Using the right-hand rule, we point our thumb in the opposite direction of the change in magnetic flux, and the direction in which our fingers curl indicates the direction in which current flows. This is built into the Faraday's law equation by placing a negative sign in front of the N, where N represents the number of turns or coils on the solenoid. Let's have another look at the complete equation. Remember, the E stands for the induced EMF. The N stands for the number of turns in a coil. And the delta phi over delta T stands for the rate of change in magnetic flux. I also want you to notice that there is a negative sign in front of the N. This negative sign indicates the direction of the EMF and of the induced current. From this equation, we can say that the induced EMF, or current, has the opposite sign compared to the rate of change in magnetic flux. Remember, a positive or negative sign are often used to indicate direction. So in this case, we can say the induced EMF, or current, is in the opposite direction to the change in magnetic flux. We now have a better grasp of electromagnetic induction and Faraday's law and the link with the direction of the induced current. Next time, we can look at some applications of the derived equation. I'll see you then.